Okay, so we made it to Gulf Coast Research Lab. Pretty excited. I'm here with Craig Lawson. Um, Craig, tell us where we are, tell us who you are, and then tell us what we're about to go see. Sounds good. Uh, like you said, my name is Craig Lawson. I'm the system support technician here at the Gulf Coast Research Lab Aquaculture Division. And right now we're standing inside of the building that's known as Red Snapper Grow Out, but it's actually our triple tail holding cool. grow out and spawning facility. Cool, 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 cool. So what tank are we about to go look at right now? We're about to go look at tank eight. It's going to be uh, one of our smaller fish concentration tanks that we're holding for grow out in terms of uh, having to eventually spawn them out, hopefully in the next coming year. So we're going to be spawning these fish in the coming year. So it's January right now. So that spawn's going to be coming up April, May. We're going to start moving these fish, start spawning, and then you'll eventually have a big grow out in the next year. Uh, so for our larger tanks, we're probably going to be moving some more of our brood stock that we're going to be collecting over the course of the next year. But collection season is going to start later on in the fall when they all start surfacing and moving towards the buoys. Cool. The wild. But yes, you were right. The spawning is going to actually probably occur in the spring. All right. Fun, fun. All right. So we're going to walk over right now to tank eight and take a look at these fish. It's going to be fun. We're going to take a look at these fish. Cool. Okay, so that's awesome. I really like this. Tell me about, uh, just give me the rundown on the tank. Well, this holding tank is 16 foot diameter. It's about five and a half foot depth. And for the amount of fish that are in here, we're not even close to taxing its biological holding capability. Right. Uh, we have had anywhere between 18 and 24 fish in this tank at any given moment. And the fish you see here, the vast majority of them were introduced at the end of the fall last year. So coming on closer to winter, probably about November. How big were they when you brought them in? They were about, I would say the largest one was about two to three inches shorter. And we've had an increase anywhere between half and a full kilo in terms of weight, I'd say. Let's convert that to pounds. Uh, so anywhere between one and 2.5 pounds. In a year? In a year. That's great. So um, the triple tail is a saltwater fish. So uh, tell us what our salinity is here and any other water quality parameters that are important uh, for raising triple tail. So the salinity we are attempting to mimic the outside water in which they came from as much as possible. That's in the Gulf of Mexico. That's correct. So depending on their point of collection, which this is a mix of them, so we try to keep it at a steady intermediate number between that range. So we've gone between 18 and uh, 24 parts per thousand. Parts per thousand, okay, great. And um, in order to maintain water quality and water clarity like this, um, talk to me about uh, the filtration. I know that you've got um, what I think was a propeller bead filter uh, on the outside of the building yes. as a clarifier. And you've got a moving bed reactor um, and then you've also got a protein skimmer. Do you have any other type of filtration on here? Uh, we have a UV sterilizer. Cool. That is on the end of the mechanical loop. We have a two loop filtration system. Okay. You mentioned before. Right. The mechanical filtration system involves the propeller wash bead filter. Right. And the biological domain feature is the moving bed bioreactor. Right. So the uh, UV sterilizer works at the very end of the mechanical filtration loop to just kill any harmful stuff that's actually made it through the uh, sure. micron filtration. And, and our protein skimmer, typically used in saltwater systems, because that's going to be taking out uh, a lot of those fine solids that could make it through the bead filter, correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, we're going to walk over and take a look at some of the uh, paired filtration that you will use or could use with the bead filter. Since the bead filter can be used in so many different ways, um, Craig and the, uh, the folks here at GCRL are using the bead filter primarily as a clarifier. The extra biological filtration that you get from the propeller bead is just going to be extra for free, right? 
most of the biological filtration that they are going to be focused on in the design is going to be with the moving bed bioreactor. So pairing those is something that's done all the time. So let's go ahead and take a look at the paired filtration um, uh, that's typically used in a system like this. Okay, come on. This is our moving bed bioreactor. It's pretty much the star of our biological filtration loop and it's the thing that receives the most flow through coming out of our biological filtration loop. It's the first thing on the line that comes back in from the pump and it's going to take care of the majority of our nitrogenous waste. Okay, um, and then uh, over here, Craig. That's our protein skimmer. The protein skimmer, like you were saying before, takes care of a lot of the fine solids and larger organic molecules. It's next in line. They both have direct flow through back to the tank, but since priority is given to the moving bed bioreactor, the protein skimmer sort of serves as sort of a polishing and after filtration uh, peripheral for the system. Cool, and then our UV sterilizer right here. Our UV sterilizer is actually on our mechanical loop, so as you can see, it's, it's paired with the stands for our biological filtration, but it actually comes back in off of the loop that holds our uh, feed filter on it. And that serves as a, as a uh, bacterial destruct unit for the rest of the mechanical loop. We don't want that on our biological filtration system because that relies heavily on bacteria that we culture within the moving bed bioreactor. Sure, sure, sure. So um, UV, if uh, you're getting new fish, UV is going to be uh, heavily used for new fish coming into the facility. You're going to do anything in addition to that, or is your UV running all the time for a system like this, or is it just run at the beginning? For a system like this, we actually don't use UV when we're culturing the system in uh -huh. order to allow our bacterial populations to grow to a solid amount. Right. When we put fish in here and we start to see ammonia levels rise as the fish produce nitrogenous waste, we're going to turn the UV on in turn in, to allow the mechanical filtration unit to boost its productivity. Right, 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 right. Okay, very good. And, uh, and again, uh, what do we say? We're at like 18 to 24 parts per thousand in a tank like this. So a protein skimmer is going to be taking out a lot of those fine solids to keep that water very clear, right? And with triple tail, do we, you know, talk a little bit about the research? Are we looking to have this be, um, uh, how many folks are growing triple tail and, and is this something that um, you're hoping will uh, boost a, a commercial market for? The triple tail program we have at this university is actually a public private partnership uh -huh. between the University of Southern Mississippi and an outside commercial group, they're called the Persiformis Group, and they work with Global Blue Aquaculture. The triple tail market is emerging, I would say. Yeah. So not a whole lot of people have done research in terms of the best triple tail to use for production. Right. And there's no standardized production protocol set yet. So you all are setting that? We're hoping to, yes. Cool. And how long have you been growing these particular fish? These, these came in a year ago, so we're a year in with them. You're hoping to breed these this year and then have, you know, so are we at population one, two, three, and how far along are we? It's population one throughout the entire building. The oldest fish in this system came in two years ago, uh -huh. and the newest fish came in last year around the fall. Okay. This is cool. Now, uh, just, just give me a quick, uh, in case I want to start growing some triple tail of my own, um, is it an easy thing? Is it a hard thing? Is it akin to something else that you've grown before? You know, uh, is there, is it, just give me the difficulty level of growing triple tail. Uh, compared to the fish that, uh, my background is largely in marine aquariums. Uh huh. So compared to fish keeping for, in terms of like, say your marine ornamental species. Yeah. These fish are incredibly hardy. Yeah. They eat incredibly well, and they've grown a whole lot in captivity since we brought them in here. Cool, cool, cool. I like it. I'll... Okay, so uh, that's the uh, triple tail system, tank eight. And uh, thank you so much, Craig Lawson, for showing us around. We're going to do two more videos on other systems here at GCRL. 
And hopefully this is something that we, we end up doing a good bit of uh, videos on because these folks really have their stuff together. They really got some top-notch research going on that is applicable, all right? So stay tuned for those coming up.